welcome everyone. King's Politics is delighted to be joined by Jacob Reese Mogg. He is the MP for Northeast Somerset since 2010. In 2019, he became leader of the House of Commons and the Lord President of the Council. Prior to politics, he was one of the founders of Somerset, uh, Somerset Capital Management. And um, as a politician, he is notable for being one of the leading Eurosceptics campaigning, campaigning for leave in the 2016 referendum. The format of this interview will see 30 to 35 minute, minutes of interview-led questions, with the remainder of the session going to audience questions. Uh, those who are viewing may submit, uh, submit questions at the end through the chat function. Uh, to begin, uh, you, you are known for being, you are known for your traditional public image, having been named the Honourable Member for the 18th century, and you have authored a book called, uh, titled The Victorians. Uh, what lessons and benefits have you conferred from the past which have helped you deal with challenges in your political career? Well, I, I think history is a very good guide for politicians because many of the problems that arise require the same mental approach to solve. It's not that the problems are the same, but it's how do you think things through? Uh, what did people get right? What did they get wrong? How did things evolve and develop? And so I think having a good understanding of history is very beneficial uh, for seeing what policy decisions you should make. And I mean, I'll give you a very specific and very important example. I think the policy decisions made by central bankers and indeed the, the, the then government, and Alistair Darling deserves credit for this, in 2008-9 during the financial crisis, clearly learned from the mistakes that were made after the great crash in 1929 uh, and the opposite approach that was then taken by the federal reserve which led to a very serious slump and so learning about how people approach the problem and the decisions they made can save you from a very high risks in future um, as mentioned before, prior to, um, prior to politics, you had a successful, successful career in finance and investments. In what ways uh, did your experience in the hedge fund industry and starting up some set capital management set you up for a career in politics? Uh, any lessons that you conferred from that? Yes. Um, I, I wasn't actually in the hedge fund business. I was in the long only um, asset management business, which is, is slightly different, uh, but it's a very similar field. Uh, what do you learn from that? Uh, well, I'll divide it into two parts. One, what do you learn from investment management uh, as an activity? And two, what do you learn from setting up a business? From investment management activity, I was very lucky in that I specialized in global emerging markets. And therefore, I traveled very widely to visit the companies that we were investing in across a wide range of developing countries. And that certainly increased my bank of knowledge about international affairs, about business opportunities, about the success of free trade. If you look at the success, for example, of South Korea, that at the end of the Korean War had a GDP per capita lower than Somaliland, and is now one of the richest countries in the world. And it's done that primarily through the ingenuity of its people and through being very enthusiastic about trade. So you learn economic lessons, you learn about the world, uh, and you learn about how businesses can succeed. So that's the investment management part. In a strange way though, the most important lessons came to me um, in 2007 when I set up my own business. And I, I don't really think of myself as an entrepreneur, but actually what I did was what entrepreneurs do, that I left a comfortable and reasonably well-paid job to set up my own business with a small team of people who were very enthusiastic, keen to do things their own way. And then you meet the bureaucracy that you get when you set up your own business. You know, suddenly you're in charge and all these things that were done by other people, you're responsible for. So you have to work out how do you deal with health and safety. When you set up an office, one of the first things you do is have to uh, do a health and safety check. And you may think that for people working in office, this um, is not a very onerous responsibility, but actually there's a lot of important bureaucracy you have to uh, set up your relationship with hmrc for value added tax you have to um, work through all the details that when you're working for a big firm are taken care of by somebody else and they fall on you as the chief executive of the business to get it right and you learn about employing people you learn about no longer continuing to employ people which is one of the realities of running an own business, which is one of the most difficult things you ever have to do as a, as a business manager. 
you learn about what in this country makes it easier to start a business and what makes it difficult, where the road uh, humps are. So in terms of practical politics and understanding the challenges faced by businesses in my constituency, probably learned more that's directly useful to politics um, through the entrepreneurial activity uh, than I did through the investment activity, though that also had benefits, as I've mentioned. Um, I wanted to touch upon recent events in Parliament surrounding Owen Paterson. Uh, you and the Prime Minister have made it was wrong to defend his um, his lobbying. Um, his lobbying. What underpinned the initial thinking behind um, defending Owen Paterson, despite the fact that he did clearly break lobbying rules? Um, yes. I mean, everyone's clear that you should not use your position in Parliament uh, to be a paid lobbyist, that that is not what you are there for. Owen's defence was that he was pointing out a serious wrong and that the antibiotics in milk that he discovered um, were potentially um, endangered life. So he said that he was allowed to do it because there was a, an exemption in the rules for highlighting a serious harm. And that, that is true. And he then said that the 23 month process that he had gone through uh, had been responsible for the death of his wife. And he told me this um, last year, uh, shortly after Rose had died. And I'm afraid I felt that somebody who had suffered so much should not be made to suffer further and that he had a case, I think not a very strong case actually in defense of what he'd done, but he had a case. He had a stronger case about the lack of a proper appeals process, so he had a due process case. But he had this overwhelming family tragedy and uh, he is a friend of mine and I had just overwhelming sympathy for the tragedy that had struck him and this clouded my political judgment. And Look, I was clearly wrong. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to defend my mistake, but I hope that if you understand why I made the mistake, you will see that it was a mistake that I think many people may well have made. Uh, I guess another issue that has uh, arisen in recent events is uh, regarding the former Attorney General, Sir Geoffrey Cox, and his, um, the debate as to whether MPs should have another job. Do you think MPs can sufficiently fulfill their obligations to their constituents and their national interests whilst balancing other, other interests, other jobs and other priorities? Um, I think yes, in principle they can, <clears throat> but it depends on prioritising uh, their political responsibility, prioritising the national and constituent interest. And that will in many ways be a case by case basis that some people work more efficiently than others. Some people uh, get more done in five hours than other people get done in 10 hours. Um, some people are representing um, constituents who actually want to have somebody who is capable of earning successfully and think that that is a benefit to them because they get that level of expertise. But I think there has to be clear bounds. You have to be putting politics first you have to be um, uh, avoiding uh, conflicts of interest between your outside earnings and the work you're doing as a, as a member of parliament. Um, and as long as that's being done, I think voters can decide perfectly reasonably for themselves. But let's work through the other case. Say you were to ban any outside interests. Now, Earlier this morning, I actually did a telephone call uh, relating to the Oxford Union's charity. And I am an unpaid um, trustee of the Oxford Union. Seems to me doing outside charitable work of that kind is perfectly reasonable. But once you say somebody can be a charitable trustee, you're then saying, well, what if you're paid as a charitable trustee, which is becoming more common? Is that good or bad? But if you're allowed to be a charitable trustee, are you allowed to be a doctor or a nurse? And then you go through it and you gradually come to the conclusion that it's a matter for the electorate rather than for the rules, because it's a matter of, of taste. 
rather than of right or wrong? Do you think being a doctor is all right? And during the pandemic, a lot of MP doctors and nurses went back to the health service. But you think being a lawyer is not right. But what if you're a lawyer who regularly deals with miscarriages of justice and is able to get people who've been wrongly imprisoned freed from prison? Would you then say that was right or wrong? Because that could be easily part of your um, political belief, couldn't it? You should say, I think that uh, one of the things I want to do in politics is overturn um, false imprisonments, and I can use my expertise to do this. And then whether you're paid or unpaid, it's taking a great deal of time. So drawing the lines as to what you like and what you don't like is very hard. I think setting the general principle that you must put your constituents first uh, and that you mustn't be a paid lobbyist is much, is much clearer. And then, of course, in the end, we are all the servants of our constituents who can decide at the election whether they want to have us or not. Uh, I guess in light of recent events, the opposition and many others have accused, the, have accused Tory MPs and the government of sleaze. Um, what I wanted to ask is, and this ranged from a variety of issues from contracts during the pandemic uh, to this case of lobbying, how do you respond to those who have genuine concerns about corruption and sleaze in the government amongst Tory MPs? And is there a need for a systemic change in the system? Well, when it comes to Labour making accusations of sleaze, it is worth remembering that the Labour Party has had to spend £2 million on legal fees in relation to its anti-Semitic activities, and that the Labour Party has uh, six members of Parliament in recent years who have gone to prison, and a seventh who has just received a suspended sentence. So I, I really think the Labour Party accusing the Conservatives um, is... Uh, uh, very unwise. A a every party, every organisation will periodically have people in it who do wrong things. But I think that British politics is extraordinarily honest, one of the most honest political systems anywhere in the world, not just today, but in all our recent history. So I think we should be very proud of the cleanliness of British politics. As regards the um, PPE contract, this is absolute nonsense. I mean, it really is cheap, erroneous political point scoring. When the um, crisis hit, we needed PPE and we needed it quickly. The average government contract takes three to six months to award for very good reasons, because you have lots of checks in place. But we didn't have three to six months. We had to get on with it. And in getting on with it, um, we awarded contracts quickly and we got the amount of PPE produced in the UK up, excluding gloves, from I think under 1% to 60 to 70%. So we suddenly had a supply of PPE that we needed. And actually what happened with PPE is exactly the same as happened with the vaccine. Contracts were awarded quickly to make sure that we could get on with it. And both in PPE and in the vaccine, this was very important in our COVID response. And I was reading in the paper today, I'll see if I can find it for you, because it's quite an interesting story. And I'll tell you about um, something I did uh, with somebody who got in touch with me. Um, here we are. It's drug made from antibodies works better than vaccines. Okay. So shortly after the first lockdown began, I got uh, a letter from... A doctor who I don't know, I've never met, he sent it recorded delivery to my home address, saying from his work he thought that antibodies would be a really important part of the cure, and that this was something we should get on with as a matter of urgency. Now look, I'm no doctor, I know nothing about whether antibodies are a good cure or a bad cure, but I thought it was an absolute responsibility of mine to get that letter into the system so that people who knew about it could have a look at it. And that's what was going on. People were getting in touch with MPs saying, we can provide PPE. The country needed PPE. And of course those things were passed on to ministers. This was absolutely the right thing to do. And, and saying it was sleazy is ridiculous. There, there's a company that got a contract of 180 million pounds, uh, which is linked either to a Labour donor or a Labour peer. It's nothing to do with party politics. 
I think moving on more specifically on the pandemic, um, currently right now there's rising rising cases across uh, across Britain as well as other uh, nations which are highly vaccinated. What are your personal views on the reimposition of restrictions and is the government will, willing to put further restrictions on our personal liberties again if needed? Okay, I mean I, I think actually we've been rather luckier than other countries that we've been falling recently rather than rising but you're quite right that being vaccinated is not an absolute guarantee against catching COVID. Um, uh, but um, it is a very strong um, uh, uh, lower likelihood of death. So we're not seeing hospitalizations rise at the same level uh, and we're not seeing deaths rise at the same level. So that's really important. The, the government set out plan A and plan B, as you know. Plan B would impose some moderate further restrictions, uh, but um, that isn't necessary. It doesn't seem as if it's going to be necessary. Uh, in the end, we are going to have to live with COVID, that we can't go back to a system where we are permanently locked down or that we're locked down every winter. Uh, we have to recognise this is a serious disease, but that it, treatments have improved massively. What I was saying to you about antibodies is really interesting. Vaccines have had a phenomenal effect and booster jabs seem to be working extremely well. So um, plan B is a possibility, but it is very unlikely in my view that we would go to the more severe end of lockdown uh, as we had earlier this year. Uh, I guess taking a look at the government's actions in dealing with the COVID crisis um, over the past one and a half years, uh, undoubtedly mistakes were made, but it seems on multiple occasions, either the same mistakes were being repeated or the government action was going against the concerns of the scientists. How do you respond to those who would indict the government with, fa with failing in dealing with the pandemic overall? I mean, I think if you look at it, um, you see that people give their advice in good faith and the politicians then have to make decisions. Uh, but the scientists themselves admit that some of the advice they gave at the beginning of the pandemic didn't turn out to be right. Some of the forecasts for the number of people who would die turned out, fortunately, uh, to be much higher than then happened. So what you're trying to do is to make judgments based on an overall balance of risk with a high degree of uncertainty on the advice that you are uh, being given. And it's very interesting that, that um, about last year, just I suppose October or November, there was a lot of talk about having a fire break lockdown. Wales had one, England didn't. Um, in Wales it didn't work. So not having the lockdown the fire break lockdown was not a mistake because it didn't work. The fact you had to have a lockdown later does not mean that the earlier lockdown would automatically have worked. Um, just to a further question of that, if you and the government could go back and change, I suppose, one aspect of how the pandemic was handled, what would you change? Well, I think actually it's better to wait for the inquiry because I think there will be all sorts of things that you will look back on and think that those could have been done better and you'll look back at some things and think goodness we did those really well. Um, the only comment I, I would make at this stage is that we have a Civil Contingencies Act which is available to provide for emergencies when you don't have laws in place and this and this is my area as leader of the House of Commons so that's why I perhaps have a particular interest in it. Um, that act proved to be unworkable for COVID uh, and we had to introduce specific legislation and it seems to me that if you've got a Civil Contingencies Act that won't work when you have a civil contingency on the scale of COVID you have to ask yourself when would that act ever work uh, and, and I think that is something that will need to be reviewed but I think it is better to wait for the inquiry because we're going to want to look globally I mean, the Daily Mail is reporting today that um, uh, Sweden is having cases uh, falling quite sharply whilst the rest of Europe is having them rise quite sharply and we'll need to look at what all other countries did not just what the ones who had stricter lockdowns did to try and work out what the best response was um, in all sorts of different circumstances. Uh, another aspect of the pandemic which I want to talk about is that it in some sense reveals the deep inequities present in our society ranging from different ethnicities, um, class, regions in England and much more. Um, what, is, what is the Conservative plan to deal with these issues as the pandemic hopefully recedes, I guess, the future vision? And this is very much part of the levelling up 
uh, agenda. That, that um, there were some figures presented uh, to the cabinet recently on life expectancy rates in different parts of the country and how they relate to uh, deprivation uh, and um, life expectancy or life expectancy in good health rates, which are particularly important, um, uh, do vary and do seem to vary uh, w with the opportunities that people have. And that's something that the government needs to tackle. Now, some of it is high levels of smoking and high levels of smoking seem to uh, coincide with high areas of deprivation. So what can be done uh, about, about that? What can be done to help uh, with that? Um, what can be done to improve wages in the less well-off areas of the country? What can be done about the infrastructure? And I don't just mean roads and rail, I also mean in terms of um, broadband. Um, so there are a whole range of initiatives focused around the overall title of levelling up, uh, which ought to help with these inequalities. But it's key to remember it's levelling up. There is no success in levelling down. That makes it worse for everybody. Uh, I saw a YouTube video where an individual with cerebral palsy confronted you about, I guess, his predicament. Uh, he had lost his job and was asked to prove he had a disability to claim benefits. Um, from that video, he was clearly distressed. What I wanted to ask is, what further actions can the government do to ensure that the most vulnerable in our society are taken care of? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's very important to treat people fairly. And as a constituency MP, one of the things that you do is take up cases for individuals where the system has let them down. Now, when I first became an MP in 2010, the system was being changed. So disability benefit was moving to personal uh, independence payments and there were significant changes and there was a decision made that everybody claiming a disability benefit should be tested to see that they were genuinely disabled and that doesn't seem to me to be unreasonable that you need to ensure that benefits are going to people who um, deserve them uh, and who qualify for them and I had at that point in, in the years afterwards quite a number of people who came to me saying the system hadn't worked for them. And I took their cases up, I took their cases up with ministers, and having raised them with ministers, if they had been treated badly, I managed to get those cases put right. Um, some people, on the other hand, didn't actually have a disability, but had been getting disability payments. And that was a mistake, they shouldn't have been. And so the system is now much more focused but once the first round of tests was done, the process has been changed and improved. So there was a point at which you would have to be reassessed, uh, I think, every year. Now, if you have a permanent disability that will not improve, you no longer need to be reassessed. Uh, and you may think this is obvious. I certainly do. I, I have a constituent um, who came to me a couple of times uh, who... Uh, is a double amputee. Well, you know, what on earth was the point of reassessing a double amputee? This, this person was obviously disabled, obviously needed support, and once was quite enough just to check that your information was correct. And so those changes have been made to try and make it uh, fairer for people, whilst also ensure that taxpayers' money supports the right people who genuinely have disabilities. Um, this is a, this will be the last question before I give it to the audience. Uh, most of the people who are who are watching this this right now are very likely young university students, and I, I, as I'm sure you know, statistically they tend to vote Labour. How would you pitch the Conservative Party to them? Um, I think it's all about the basis of conservatism and the basis of socialism. That the Conservative Party believes fundamentally that you know best how to lead your own lives. And that your coming together in groups and communities builds up society and builds up the nation. Whereas the socialist believes that the centre knows best and should try and direct you in how you lead your life. And how does this translate into practical politics? Well, I think my role in life as a politician is to take obstacles out of your path so that you have the freedom to lead, lead the life you want to do, rather than trying to put obstacles in your way to point you in a certain direction. So it's how do you view society? 
do you view it as individuals coming together or you do you view it as a collective that ought to be guided and i very much believe uh, in the former i think the random decisions of 60 70 million people lead to better outcomes than central guidance and central planning i think central planning tends to fail partly because you simply don't have the ability to deal with all the data that are available whereas individuals are able to make decisions for themselves that come together to create a better and stronger society and once you've taken that basic political difference to who do you support the individual or the center you then have to develop policies that work with um, people's natural ambitions and intentions in life yep so um, we're going to go to audience questions. So if anyone here has a question, you can just put it in the chat box. And um, the first question asks, do you have any regret about lying to the Queen to prorogue Parliament? Uh, well, I didn't. Um, so that's a really very silly question, actually. Um, the um, two courts took completely different views as to whether what we had done or not was, was right. The Supreme Court found against it but the High Court unanimously found that it was a perfectly proper exercise of the prerogative. And both I and the government think that the Supreme Court was simply wrong, was fundamentally wrong on the point about whether prorogation is a proceeding in Parliament. Uh, and in its judgment, it said it wasn't, but that misunderstands what Parliament is. Parliament is the Queen in Parliament, and it begins with the state opening when Parliament is gathered together, when the Lords and Commons come together in front of the Queen, and it is ended by the prorogation or dissolution of parliament when once again, the whole of parliament comes together uh, in front of the queen or the queen's um, uh, nominees um, uh, to end that particular session. And acts of parliament are not acts of parliament until they are approved by the queen. So it is not just lords and commons being separate independent bodies. It is lords, commons and sovereign. And if you have any understanding of your history of how parliament uh, developed and evolved you would be aware that the meeting of parliament which we see uh, when you have the state opening and the prorogation is the historic parliament before the members of parliament went off separately in the house of commons and then from the reign of i think william the fourth uh, the monarch stopped regularly attending proceedings in the house of lords and so i think that judgment on proceedings in parliament was simply wrong and failed to understand the history of parliament so the advice given to the Queen was proper uh, and the court in the end um, came to a wrong decision. Another question reads, the British government has criticized Chinese territorial claims in the South China Sea and set an aircraft carrier to the region. At the same time, the UK, gov UK government has announced that it is increasing its nuclear weapon stock bar by 40% in violation of the treaty um, on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and the ICG has rejected Britain's uh, claims over, over Diego Garcia. Do you believe that the UK's position on such international issues are tenable in light of these actions? Uh, yes, I do completely. Um, that that um, uh, the um, freedom of the high seas is a very important principle, one of the oldest principles uh, of international law, and it is crucial that the UK government supports that. It's something that we have been very committed to uh, historically. Um, the the uh, number of nuclear weapons that we have and the facilities that have nuclear weapons that are, are um, absolutely essential to our long-term self-defense and a completely uh, reasonable decision for us to take. And I do not believe breach the non-proliferation uh, treaty. And as, as regards Diego Garcia, well, that's a complex legal issue. It was settled many years ago. Um, the International Court can make its rulings, but they're not uh, legally binding rulings. So I think we are completely within our rights to behave as we have done. Uh, another question reads, there is a picture of you lying down on the House of Commons bench during a crucial debate for a bill. Do you feel this display, display of entitlement reflects your attitude to the people of this country? That is, you don't respect them. Uh, no, um, it wasn't a crucial debate on a bill anyway. Um, uh, it, it was um, uh, a debate um, a around the um, endless uh, wrangling, trying to overturn the referendum results that people wanted to do. Um, no, I, 
I was um, lounging on the bench because actually that is how historically members of the front bench sat. It, it was no more and no less than that. But in terms of respecting the British people, I'm the one who was respecting them in that debate because I was standing up their referendum vote, whereas the people on the other side uh, were um, trying to overturn what the British people had voted for and held democracy in contempt. So my um, uh, um, complaint was against those who loathe democracy when it gives them the wrong answer. Uh, another question reads, uh, do you feel you have an idea of what ordinary people go, uh, in this country go through in their day-to-day -day lives? On the surface, it appears, you, it appears you don't. How do you feel you can represent them? Well, the first thing I would say is that it is desperately condescending to have this concept of ordinary people. Are, are you telling me that there are ordinary people and there are uh, distinguished graduates at Cambridge? You know, there's no such thing as an ordinary person. Everybody is exceptional in his or her own individual way. And I'm afraid I think politicians and those receiving an elite education who refer condescendingly to uh, ordinary people ought to look to themselves and into their own hearts as to the language that they use, because they are thinking that they're very special and then there are people who are less special than them. And I really think that's not a suitable, it's not a polite use of language. So when you ask me what I think the question, I hope the question intends, is how do I relate to my constituents, who are very exceptional people. Um, I relate to them because they come and see me, they write to me, and I am their champion. My role as a constituency MP is to take up the cases my constituents bring to me, however difficult their lives are, and many of them lead much harder lives than I do, and then go out to bat for them to try and get redress of grievance for them. And it's one of the beauties of our political system, one of the real glories of our political system, is the accessibility that members of parliament uh, have with and to their constituents. And even after uh, the tragic death of David Amos, it is so important that members of parliament remain available and open to their constituents, because that's how you understand how people lead their lives, the challenges that they face, and that's how you then take that back to Westminster and try and improve it in the policy decisions that are made. Another question reads, do you believe that Irish unification is a possibility or even a likelihood? Would you support a referendum in Northern Ireland? Well, the conditions set down for a referendum, um, and it's a legal obligation on the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland uh, to approve a referendum if these conditions are met. And so that is, I think, a perfectly a rational legal basis, but I don't think it's likely that those conditions will be met in the near future. But no, I'm a unionist. I think Northern Ireland is a very important part uh, of my country, uh, and I want it to remain part of my country. Uh, any additional questions, uh, feel free to put on the chat box. or you can send it to me privately through the chat box as well. And How do you plan to end violence against women and make the UK a safe place for women? This is a really important question, um, and the government is following a number of initiatives to try uh, and improve safety for women. And it is fundamentally important that women should feel safe going about their business, whatever their business happens to be. Um, so there is a strategy to reduce violence against women and girls, uh, and this involves additional government expenditure in streetscape safety. Um, it's also, there's been the domestic violence Act that passed through Parliament last year to try and make it uh, easier to prosecute for domestic violence and to ensure that the police and courts provide greater support for people who bring complaints of domestic violence. Uh, there's also um, uh, s several initiatives uh, to try and ensure that convictions for rape improve and that the treatment of women who make complaints about rape um, are better treated and that the justice system deals with them fairly. So it's a multi-pronged strategy. It's having extra police on the streets to make people feel safer. 
It's about making the court system work better. But it's also as much as anything about culture change to encourage everybody in society, men particularly, uh, to behave in a better way towards women. Uh, and so you need the steps the government can take, which are financial, are initiatives, are legal, along with societal changes, so that people recognize uh, that behavior that they may have thought was reasonable 20 or 30 years ago wasn't reasonable then and certainly isn't reasonable now. And I think things um, are moving in, in, in the right direction. The great tragedy of Sarah Everard's murder, which I think was so shocking to the whole nation, has focused people's minds even more on this issue. Um, and another question is, do you think the proliferation of misinformation and the uh, echo tunnel effect um, of social media poses difficulty to, uh, for individual decision makers and therefore democracy? Um, I'm sort of yes and no. Um, first of all, I think that misinformation has always been with us. And it's not just a phenomenon of social media, but social media spreads it further. And social media, and you're absolutely right, is an echo chamber effect that people only follow on social media the views that they want to follow. And therefore, they get less exposure uh, to other alternative views. Um, and I worry about the, the council culture and the effort to shut down debate when thank you for having me this afternoon because I noticed that there are a number of people who don't share all my views on the um, call today but it's really important that we should have a civilized discussion and a frank discussion uh, which we are doing via a form of social media um, if you wish to call zoom a form of social media but I think in broad terms it is I, I worry that people go on Twitter and phrase themselves in a more angry way than they would if they were speaking to somebody in person. I mean, I'll give you an example. It's, um, uh, I'm not sure it's a subject I should joke about, but it is quite funny. Uh, somebody wrote to me during the last election, say, Dear Mr. Smog, uh, I'm so sorry I issued a death threat against you uh, on Twitter. I was very angry at the time. Well, I'd never noticed he'd done this until he wrote to me. But it rather made me feel what I've always thought, that people get angry and they say things that they don't really mean but Twitter gives them a status that makes them feel as if this is a, uh, and makes the person who it's pointed against feel as if this is a really hostile statement. And that is very unhealthy, particularly for people who aren't in public life. If, if you're in public life, people are gonna be rude to you, that, that's life. But it's very unpleasant in much smaller social circumstances. So the people with, the, the teenagers with, 30 Instagram followers when three of them are rude is under much greater pressure than the Member of Parliament with 100,000 Instagram followers who when people are rude don't notice. And so it's trying to protect uh, people um, who aren't public figures probably even more than those who are public figures. Uh, do you think that Northern Ireland was given enough attention during the Brexit negotiation? Further, uh, in this in this post-Brexit period, do you think uh, do you think that it is wrong for the EU and the Conservative government to use Northern Ireland as a political pawn in their post-Brexit nego uh, negotiation engagements? Um, I mean, I'm a committed unionist, and I think that not being able to have completely free trade with Northern Ireland is is quite wrong. Um, was it taken too lightly in the negotiations? Um, before I got into government, I was chairman of the European Research Group. And we wrote paper after paper on how Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland question should be answered. We spent a lot of time on it. I think the previous government, Theresa May's government, um, was very weak on Northern Ireland uh, and left us in a position when Boris Johnson became prime minister where so much had been given away that it was very hard to draw any of it back. But that the treaty that we signed, if followed in good faith, has within it the capability for Northern Ireland to operate very effectively with the rest of the United Kingdom, with safeguards to protect Northern Ireland being used as a place to smuggle goods into the European Union. That was really what the protocol was about. But the EU, in my mind, has been very stubborn so far in assuming that things that, I mean, 
A delivery from Marks and Spencers of sandwiches to a store in Northern Ireland is not going to be smuggled into the Republic. It just isn't. That law-abiding companies doing lawful things are not suddenly going to turn criminal. And trying to regulate all of that, I think, has not been an act of good faith by the European Union and wasn't how we understood the Northern Ireland Protocol. So that, therefore, it will need to be uh, changed and renegotiated. Um, but I think Northern Ireland got, certainly from my point of view and the discussions I had, um, a very significant amount of attention in the negotiations. And at that point, I was very, working very closely with a number of members of parliament from Northern Ireland. Uh, in light of the murder of David, uh, David Ms. Uh, recently and Joe Cox a few years ago, what actions need to be taken to reduce violence uh, in our political culture without putting up uh, barriers between MPs and their constituents? Well, I don't really know is the honest answer to that question. Um, those two murders are so tragic uh, that really good people deeply committed to their constituents, doing their constituency work, just hacked down in the most brutal way is a terrible, terrible tragedy um, for politics as well as for their families. But both of them were people who were open and available to their constituents. Um, I think you can, be, you can do sensible things. So I've always had appointments for my constituency surgeries. But that's really because when I first started, I just said there would be a time you'd come from two till four. And what do you do at 2.30 if there's nobody there? Do you go or do you wait till four just in case somebody turns up? And it's just much more time efficient to have appointments. But that also means you know who's coming. I don't advertise where my surgeries are going to be anymore. And that was because I had mass protesters turn up at a surgery. And... I mean, Frankly, I thought they were ridiculous, but they upset my constituents. So from then on, I said, well, I'll only tell you where the surgery is taking place once you've got an appointment. So that the people who come are the people who know they're, know they're coming. Um, but I'm absolutely determined to remain as open to my constituents in North East Somerset as I always have been. Uh, I won't have, oh, I won't go into what I won't have. I better not because I, I um, wouldn't go into details of of security, but I will not stop being open to my constituents. Uh, is there any additional questions um, from this group? Uh, what do you think about the difficult, uh, difficulties faced by transgender people in society and in particular healthcare? What can the government do to improve their experience? Um, well, it, I mean, this is a, a very important issue um, for people facing those challenges. I, I think in uh, healthcare, the healthcare system is very respectful uh, of people, but it's important to make sure that people receive the healthcare that they need when they need it, regardless uh, of who they are. Any additional questions from, uh, from this chat? Uh, do you think there is a future for the Human Rights Act of 1998 um, under continued conservative leadership? Well, the, the, the Human Rights Act is there. I mean, I've always thought the greatest protector of all our human rights is the ballot box and direct democracy. I think the answer is always more democracy rather than less democracy. And I think the Human Rights Act was part of an architecture where we were becoming less democratic and more bureaucratic that there was a feeling that you should hand more powers over to unelected quangos, that the whole architecture around European law was without in influence of your directly elected parliament. Uh, and the Human Rights Act fed into that because if the decision are made, decisions are made by people who aren't accountable at the ballot box, then they have to be accountable somewhere and the courts was a good place to have that accountability. But that that accountability is less relevant if you can change your government and how you're governed once every five years at the ballot box. And then it's for Parliament to make the laws and people to decide whether they like the laws that Parliament's made at an ensuing general election. By 1997, uh, post the Maastricht Treaty, our influence over our own laws had declined very significantly. And so the only recourse was, was to the courts. And the balance between the courts and Parliament shifted very greatly post 1972. And I think post 2016, particularly post 2020, uh, we will find 
um, that, that uh, we're getting back into a, into a better balance. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, do you maintain that uh, abortion should be denied in cases of rape and incest? How is this more, more uh, how is morally defensible in, um, in where sexual violence has been used as a weapon of war? Um, there, there is no defense of using sexual violence uh, as a method of war at all. Um, uh, there's no question that that is um, a, a moral outrage. The, the issue that arises is at what point do you believe life begins? If you believe life begins at the point of conception, which I do, and many people do, it is a, a very, very rational belief, it's very hard to determine uh, any subsequent point at which life clearly begins, then you're talking about two lives rather than one. And you have to weigh in the balance that second life, that newly created life. And I think that newly created life is important, even if the circumstances of its creation are themselves wrong. But yes, life begins at the point of natural conception, and you have to think about this second life, the life of the baby in the womb, is important, as of course is the woman's life. Uh, so just to clarify, you would uh, deny abortion to those cases, in all cases? Uh, I, I, I think abortion is wrong, once the child is conceived from the point of conception, yes. There is a second life. And I think to ignore that second life uh, dehumanizes uh, the child in the womb. Any additional questions from the audience? Please put in the chat box. box. Um, was the media wrong to uh, berate the Supreme Court um, on their prorogation judgment, specifically regarding the use of the headline calling Lady Hell um, a ex-barmaid? Does it not, under the constitutional separation of powers, um, when the Conservative government strongly criticises decisions of the Supreme Court? Well, I think you've got to differentiate between the newspapers and politicians. Uh, politicians should not make personal attacks on the judges. So I said to you very carefully that I think the judgment was wrong, but I've made no attack on the judges involved. Um, I believe in the freedom of the press. And the thing about a free press is that sometimes it will say things uh, that even judges don't like. But the freedom of the press is fundamental uh, to our constitution. I mean, look, lots of politicians would prefer it if the press weren't rude about them from time to time. But I'm afraid if you're in public life, the press will periodically be rude about you. And the politicians ought to defend the judges. The politicians ought to be absolutely clear uh, that we respect our judges and we believe they act in good faith. We do not have to agree with every judgment, but we should defend the judges. But the press can stand up for its readers and can say uh, what it sees fit. Do you think the gap between social classes in the UK could be mitigated by exchange programmes between private and public schools? Um, I, I'm very much in favour of anything that can be done to increase social mobility in this country. I think it's um, of fundamental importance to how we succeed as a nation to ensure that we draw on all the talent that is available. And I think the public sector can learn from the private sector uh, and vice versa. But um, I, I mean, we have world beating schools in this country, but it's really interesting to see that some academies are now outperforming some of the um, leading fee-paying schools in the country and so the public sector can do supremely well and that's to be encouraged but it's by learning from how you achieve excellence we should be all in favor of achieving excellence in all areas of education what are your thoughts on the denaturalizations of britain or britons who joined isis um, is it fair to force them uh, force them onto other countries um, I'm bound by collective responsibility, and I, 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 um, I made my views quite clear before I got into government. I believe it, you're, look, um, these are very, let's deal with the generality rather than the specifics, because I think I can speak slightly more freely on the generality. But it seems to me that there should be no differential 
between British citizens. So whether you are a British citizen um, because you were born here and your family's been here for hundreds of years, or whether you were given a passport 10 minutes ago, you are equally British. There is an equality of Britishness and that you owe the duties to the state equally, but you'll be protected by the state equally. And I think this is, I think this is a really important fundamental point uh, of an equality of citizenship. I think if you want to have a real equality of op opportunity and you want to have um, effective anti-discrimination, there must not be a differential between one British citizen and another.